All right. Some people like scotch with a little water, some people like it neat, some people like it chilled but not diluted. I really like Springbank too. All right. Those, by the way, are now available in the Forgotten Weapons merch store, which I have a link to down below. But I am getting ahead of myself. Thank you for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are doing a QA and a uh, with a bunch of questions, helpfully submitted by the awesome folks who uh, are on Patreon, making Forgotten Weapons continue to happen every single day. And so let's jump right in. Uh, first up is Chris, who says, Will Headstamp Publishing explore offering English translations of non-English books, such as Vom Ursprung der Selbstladepistol by Motz and Shui? I would love it if we could, but I'm not really optimistic about the possibility. Um, the problem is, well, there, <laughs> there are a couple potential problems. The first one is the effort of translation. Um, von uh, Ursprung der Selbstlad Pistol, which is a book I'm well familiar with, but don't usually try to pronounce the full name of. Uh, it's a fantastic book on early Austrian uh, self-loading pistols, and it's been a tremendous reference for me, and it's all in German, and if you want to learn anything from it, you have to translate chunks of it out of German into English or whatever other language you speak. But the photographs are outstanding, the information that it contains is fantastic. The problem is it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Uh, there's actually three volumes of it in total, and it would be a massive undertaking to, first of all, just to have someone translate it word for word. I think people underestimate how difficult that is, and you can't do it with automated translation. You can't do that really with just regular text with automated translation, because you have to then go back through and check every bit of it manually. Um, but then if you're dealing with something that's highly technical, like a book on you know firearms developmental history, that applies even more. So you basically have to do it manually from the beginning, because you won't save any time with a mechanical translation. Then we have to get... well. It's easier to translate into English because we can do the editing on a book once it's translated into English. Um, we've also talked about the potential of releasing books in languages other than English, and one of the hitches there is finding someone who is suitably fluent in both languages and suitably fluent in gun stuff who can act as a trusted technical editor in the foreign language. Um, but the other issue that comes up is actually the rights to the images in a book, which sometimes the author owns, sometimes they don't. This is um, copyright law is complex and takes itself very seriously. And you'll see this come up related to YouTube with the use of things like images, clips from other shows or movies, or the use of music uh, in a YouTube video. Um, people own the copyright to things like music. Well, people own the copyright to images as well. And you have to get the right to use those images in a book, unless you're the person who took the image yourself. And so in some cases those image rights are easy to get, in other cases they have been purchased by the original author specifically for a particular book release, and you would have to go through all of the negotiations again to do it uh, in a, to do another book release, because it's not so simple as, well, I pay you and now I have the right to use that image. No, those agreements are often very specific as to uh, what format you can use the image in. Um, you know, for example, I looked at uh, a number of images that I wanted or was interested in purchasing for use in my own book, Chasse de Famas, and it came down to things like uh, I would be, it would be dictated how many copies I could print. If I was going to reprint the book a second time, I would have to renegotiate the rights to each individual image. Um, how big the image is displayed, is it quarter page, is it full page, that makes a difference. And so even if the books, the author's gone through all of that and they're able to publish their book in German or French or Italian, that doesn't mean that you can just easily drop it over and con translate it to Italian, to English, and use the same images. There's, there's a lot that goes into that. So there are a number of books that I would love to be able to reprint in English, and that Austrian book by Motz and Shui is one of them. Um, there are some Russian books that have come out recently on uh, Russian firearms that have fantastic photography and really good scholarship, as 
far as I can tell, not speaking Russian, that I think would be great to translate into English, but I just don't know that it's feasible, viable to do it. So, uh, Our second question is from 40 Licks, who says, says, as someone who is starting to take an interest in collecting firearms from the World War II, World War One, and World War II era, could you give some tips and tricks on what to look for? Um, anything that would say don't buy this. Um, there, so there are a few elements. Uh, when I'm looking at collectible firearms, I think it is important to recognize the relationship between price slash value and condition. You get really, really rough, ratty examples of guns that are way down on the price scale. But as you get past like 80% condition, the price kind of starts to go up uh, parabolically um, or asymptotically, because you know the difference between the the value of a 95% condition gun and a 99% condition gun can be really significant. You know, going from like 95, 98 to 100%, you might legitimately double the value of that firearm. So, if see in in my position. I like to often take these things out and shoot them, and so I kind of actually avoid adding guns to my own collection that are too nice, because that's a lot of extra value tied up in something that I have to be really delicate and careful with. I like having guns that are in like that sort of 80% condition range where I can take it out to the range, and if it gets bumped, it's one more bump amongst many that the rifles already had. It's not going to change the value of the thing anymore. It's a gun that I don't really have to worry about so much. However, there are absolutely a lot of people out there who collect specifically on condition. And so if you're just getting into this, I think that's an important consideration to understand, is what are you going to pay for a particular type of firearm depending on its condition? And it's Make sure you think about that when you're looking at, say, sold prices on classified ads and auctions and such. You can't just look at model price, model price, no, you have to also look at condition to understand what value different guns are going to bring. Um, beyond that, uh, I would say matching guns are always going to have a premium over non-matching. One of the conundrums I've run into myself um, is having the choice between two examples of the same model. One of them is, let's call it 90% condition and mismatched, which is to say not all the serial numbers are the same. Um, and not all guns are serial numbered on all the same parts. Typically the most important thing you're looking for is does the number on the receiver or barrel match the number on the bolt. So anyway, like 90% matching or 90% mismatched versus a gun that's say 75% condition but all matching. And I personally tend to fall on the side of preferring the matching lower quality example myself. So um, you can a, a mismatched gun is always going to have kind of that cloud over it of well, you know, maybe it's really nice condition, but it's not matching. Uh, which is to say someone has swapped parts out at some point in the gun's history. Uh, another thing to consider today are import marks. Since the late 1960s, uh, firearms that are imported into the United States have had to, been mar have to be marked with a variety of information. The, the make, the, manuf or the manufacturer, the model, the caliber, the name of the importer, and the location of the importer. And the legal standard, like that much is written into law, exactly how that gets applied has changed over time. So uh, you will find some early import marks are very lightly engraved, and they're say on the uh, underside of the muzzle of the gun. For example, a lot of Finnish most in the guns were imported under that sort of standard. Where today the regulations have gotten much stricter and unfortunately much worse for collectors, where now the marks have to be put on the receiver. They can't be put on any other component of the gun. Uh, and they, in some ways they have to be uh, larger. Um, you'll find, uh, actually another interesting one that came out, the guns have to be marked with serial numbers of course, which normally isn't a big deal for import, because Typically anything you're importing already has a serial number. Militaries always put serial numbers on stuff. However, I don't remember the exact date, but at a certain point um, ATF decided that you cannot use non-Latin characters in serial numbers. So 
for example, there were a lot of um, 1895 Nagant revolvers, well, a lot of Russian stuff, uh, as well as some stuff from the, the Balkans where they use the Cyrillic alphabet, where they'll have a, a serial number with a letter, prefix, or suffix, and some of those letters are in Cyrillic. Well, those no longer qualify as legal American serial numbers, and so the importer has to stamp a brand new serial number on the gun, which if they're a century they do in like the worst possible dot matrix sort of style in the just ugliest most obvious place on the gun, right smack on the side of the receiver. Anyway, what I'm getting at is if you are going to start seriously looking at collecting some of these military surplus firearms, pay attention to what the import mark is, because it will have a big impact on the desirability of a particular example. And that's not just from a resale perspective, that's also from, I personally, my own perspective as a collector. If I'm going to put this up on the wall, uh, and you know, I like admiring this cool collectible firearm I have, I want one that has as little modification to it as possible. I want uh, an import mark that's a little tiny thing under the muzzle where you'll never actually see it, or better yet, a gun that was brought back by a veteran before all these laws got passed and has no import mark at all. Which is, by the way, perfectly fine. Import marking is required for the importation process. If the gun's here, there's nothing, there's no legal issue with import marks or without. In fact, they can be legally removed. Cannot remove serial numbers. You can remove other import marks. Now the problem is that gets into refinishing the guns, which is the next thing I wanted to talk about. But getting back to my point, I'm wandering a lot already. Maybe it's the scotch. Um, I want an import mark that is as low profile as possible. So I will pay a premium to get a gun that has no import mark or a less visible one. Uh, refinishing is something that's going to be harder to determine. Um, badly done refinishing is easy to spot. Very well done refinishing is very difficult to spot, and is often mistaken for arsenal refinishing. Some guns are arsenal refinished, some are not. Um, and depending on the type of collecting, the field that you're getting into, arsenal refinished guns may or may not uh, have a, a negative uh, value associated with them. Uh, to my mind, it doesn't make that big a difference to me, uh, but I don't want one where Bubba's gone and changed. Like let's say the gun was originally parkerized and Bubba thought it'd be a lot nicer if it had a fancy blue on it, so he stripped all the parkerization off and did what actually ended up turning out to be kind of a lousy job uh, bluing the thing, and then like touched it up with some cold blue in the spots that he managed to miss with the first job. That's the kind of thing, again, you want to stay away from if you're looking at, at this from a typical collector's perspective. Uh, and then of course sporterized guns that have been physically, mechanically modified you definitely want to stay away from as a collector. Um, assuming that you want intact military condition rifles. I have a friend who collects antique sporterized uh, cartridge firing or smokeless powder rifles. So things like you know the, the pre-1899 Mausers, Carcanos, Mosins, uh, basically modern technology that happens to fall into the antique date range and has been sporterized. So it's, it's a fun collection for him. He's got a ton of really inexpensive rifles because they don't bring very much value in the general collector market, but they're all off paper because they're antiques and he really enjoys that field. So um, anyway, those are my thoughts on the matter, but as always, collect what you like and don't let my opinion on something get in the way of that. Next up, from Adam, says, As a fellow burger connoisseur, what are the essential toppings or condiments? I have a weakness for good green chili on burgers. Uh, and if it's a whole green chili that's just split open and right out on the burger, all the better. Uh, diced green chilies are okay, but I, yeah, I'm a sucker for a, sort of a New Mexican style burger. Green chili on there and, and a good sharp cheese. Maybe bacon, maybe not. Um, guacamole, sometimes, sometimes not. The essential ingredient to me uh, is green chili. Dina says, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the subject of what separates a high quality firearms book from a low quality one. This is something that um, I've gotten a little bit more perceptive about, I think, since getting involved with Headstamp and actually going through the process of publishing. 
Um, I've definitely gotten a lot, um, a lot pickier about photography, uh, looking at what we were able to do for mine and comparing that to what's kind of typical in firearms reference books. I think uh, a lot of authors skip over what can really make a book look good, and and it's not just sort of an aesthetic artistic thing, it's also the ability to see fine detail in guns. Uh, I just talked a minute ago about being able to identify refinished versus original finished guns, and with the photographs that are in most reference books, you get out, you, there's nothing you can learn about that from their photographs, but a really well photographed book, you'll be able to see some of the difference in the, the texture and the, the color tone of different types of finishes. And you can actually, you know, the best way to do this is to look at guns in person, but well done books, you can actually start to learn something about recognizing different finishes. But it's rare to find a book that's photographed well enough for that. Um, one thing that predates my own publishing work is indexes. Uh, a well done index is really important. Um, the collector grade books uh, rarely have indexes. They started adding them towards the end of um, Blake Stevens' publishing career, but most of his early books have no indices. The plan instead was to have a table of contents that was detailed enough to substitute for an index, and I don't think that plan works. Um, it's in, I think the, the organization of the book is tremendously important, and that's something that you can, you can learn about by trying to answer a very specific question with a book. So if you say, ah, and a simple end it could be, I have serial number ABC123, when was it made? And you know, it's an Enfield, look it up in the Enfield book. It's a Mauser, look it up in one of the Mauser books, and see if you can actually answer that question. Or when did BSA start making Mark II Lee Metford rifles? Um, and try to find the answer. And that will, I think, very quickly separate a book that looks good. You flip through the book and you're like, wow, there's fancy drawings and there's some tables and there's like lots of what looks like quotes from original source material. This must be a good book. And maybe it's got a lot of information on it, but if that information is not well organized, it can be excruciating trying to actually answer questions with a book. Now that's, that's of course only one of the ways that you need to use reference books like this. The other is of course reading them from cover to cover to learn the general history. And that's an area where uh, it's a different skill, but it's also a very relevant skill of managing to make the subject engaging um, and to keep a reader's interest. You can kind of presume that your reader's going to be vaguely interested in the subject to begin with because they bought the book, but if you can actually make the story really engaging, that's the mark of a really good book and a really good author. And um, for example, one one author I find very good at that is Anthony Vanderlinden. Um, his book, uh, in particular, his book on FN Mauser rifles, I think, does a fantastic job in the early uh, the introductory sections of laying out the history of FN and their Mauser rifles uh, in a way that's extremely engaging. Um, let's see. Beyond that. Good pictures, good organization, uh, engaging writing. Those are those are the most important elements to me, and I've got more picky about them um, over the years. Todd says, assuming NATO selected the 280 British cartridge as the standard for rifles in the 1950s, what would have been the choice for machine guns? Would the 280 have been used uh, for both as 762 NATO was? Would each country choose their own? Uh, logistically, a single cartridge seems to be the answer. If that's the case, which one? Um, so historically speaking, the British and the Canadians in particular were anticipating using the 280 cartridge for both uh, machine guns and rifles. And there were developmental versions of the Bren gun made in 280. They were made in Canada uh, and then shipped over to Enfield and tested by Enfield. Um, they did the same thing with the Vickers gun. There was at least, I think there was one uh, conversion of a Vickers to 280 that was trialed. They discovered there were a bunch of things that they needed to tweak to make the, the Vickers system work uh, with the 280 cartridge, largely because it was substantially shorter than 303. Uh, they also, they kind of, so they kind of recognized that the Vickers gun in 280 is kind of a weird and pointless 
begun, and frankly everyone should have known by the 50s that the Vickers was becoming obsolete anyway. A big heavy water-cooled and placed machine gun is a yeah, dubious uh, modern utility by that point. And they did recognize this, and they started development of the Taden gun, or Tadden? Taden? I think it's Taden, uh, which is effectively a belt-fed Bren gun. And that was originally started in 280 caliber. Uh, when the 280 cartridge kind of fell off, then they adapted that program to 7.62 NATO. It never ended up getting developed, but that's what the British had in mind, is they were going to use the 280 cartridge as a universal uh, service cartridge. The alternative, of course, is doing something like the Soviets did, where you have 762 by 39 as your infantry rifle cartridge and your saw cartridge with the RPD or the RPK, uh, but then having a second cartridge for uh, heavier weapons like the Maxim gun, the PK, uh, and some of the, you know, the, the vehicle mounted guns, and that would be 762 by 54 There really are pros and cons both ways. Um, We've evolved to a point today where we have a double standard, because we'll use 5.56 for infantry weapons and 7.62 NATO for heavier weapons. Um, really it's, there are logistical issues both ways, there are infantry use issues both ways. The, having a lighter cartridge for the infantry weapon means less recoil, easier training, more effective practical accuracy in the field, carrying more ammunition. but having less ballistic potential at long range, especially when you're trying to shoot through barricades or vehicles or things like that. Uh, and so the idea is, well then you give the heavier guns a separate cartridge, and then as uh, Todd suggests, you end up with some logistical issues of now you've got two kinds of ammunition that you're trying to supply. I will point out, however, that may not be as much of a logistical issue as you might think, because even if you only have one cartridge, it is often going to be supplied in different packaging that's not strictly interchangeable. So your belt-fed machine guns you're going to be supplying with ammunition in belts. And you're very, you're, yes, if everyone shares the same cartridge and troops get belted ammo for their rifles, they can pull it out of the belts and put it into magazines, but ideally in good conditions you're trying to supply everyone with exactly the ammunition they need. So you may be supplying three or four different styles of, car of ammo, even if it's all the same cartridge. These cartridges, by the way, are... I'll have to get out my calipers, but they're something like... You know, these are actually kind of close to 9 by 39 And they do add a nice chill to the scotch. All right, uh, Joseph says, if you were able to participate in another series like Project Lightning, which group of firearms would you want it to focus on? Project Lightning, of course, was the uh, series that I did with Othias and May over at CN Arsenal, testing the, uh, the light machine guns of World War I, hence lightening light machine guns. Uh, and that's an easy answer for me. I would love to do something like that with the light machine guns of World War II. One of my one of my favorite groups of firearms um, as a mechanical type are light machine guns. Uh, like magazine, not belt fed, not water cooled, bipod equipped, magazine fed, typically rifle caliber, but not always, light machine guns. I think they're really interesting, I find them a lot of fun to shoot. Um, one of the challenges would be coming up with a good set of parameters by which to judge those. That's actually a project that I kind of want to take on on my own. Not not that I'm trying to do it by myself, but it's a project that is difficult to coordinate and it's something that I want to start working on, so I plan to start doing some of that. And one of the challenges really is how do you quantitatively judge the effectiveness of a light machine gun? So I'm working on that. We'll have some content on that coming in the future. Uh, Michael says, I remember a while back you mentioned you dislike H&K's drum rear sight. Why is this? And after shooting more H&K weapons, has that opinion changed at all? Nope, it has not changed. I really don't like the H&K drum sight. And I think... So there are two reasons. Uh, they Some of them have a notch for the closest range, and the notch is, to my mind, atrocious, uh, because it's the, a notch, a style of notch you would normally put far out you know, like over the chamber of the gun, the drum puts it right back up next to your eye, and I find it virtually impossible to get any sort of reference on that notch. It's just this really big blurry thing, like 
this big at your face. And I, I find it useless. Um, now the the apertures are better, but I think I was I was thinking about it when I got this question. I'm like, why why do I hate that site so much? And I think it's because typically a well done aperture site is going to be vertical, and it's going to give you a nice flat, clear area with a round aperture in it that you can easily focus your eye through. And you want the site to be dark and the aperture to have light coming through it. And a nice crisp edge. What the HK drum does is in order to be easily manufactured in one part, they take a, a round a, you know, a cylinder and they'll put four apertures in it, but the only way you can make that actually work is to cant it at like 40, 30 or 45 degrees, so that uh, when you look through one aperture you're looking over the top of the cylinder on the opposite side. And what that does is it, instead of giving you a nice flat perpendicular um, face to the site, now you're getting one that is angled away, so it's going to be more likely to reflect light, and it's actually curved. It's, it's, it's curved when you're looking at it. So again, you're getting a variety of lighting conditions on the back face of that aperture site. And I'm pretty sure that is why I really don't like it. So uh, my HK SP5 has a red dot on it. And uh, the G3, that my, my awesome left-handed G3 that I've had for many years now, uh, I just took the rear sight and went and got rid of it entirely, because uh, Halcon Spur's rear, uh, buttstock raises the cheek, we cheek weld enough to very effectively use optics, and so I've got a red dot on that too, and those are much better than HK's drum sights. Next up, Matteo says, what is, in your opinion, the best needle fire rifle? And I think that's a really easy question to ask, and I would be very surprised if anyone disagreed with my opinion on this. And that is, okay, you saw it coming, the Chasse-Po. However, it's it's not just because the Chasse-Po is French. In fact, it's not at all because the Chasse-Po is French. There are really only three major needle fire rifles that were ever fielded by military forces. There was the Carcano, the Chasse-Po, and the Dreyse. And the Carcano is specifically made to be a conversion of muzzle loaders into breech loading guns uh, as cheaply as possible, and certainly if the example I have is anything to judge by, it's a pretty chintzy system. Like, uh, it does the job, and it did the job really cost effectively, but there's a reason that Italy scrapped those things very quickly. They're clumsy to use, they're, they're just not very good. Um, the Dreyse is a much better system, and it was designed from the ground up um, as a needle fired gun, but it is, it's 30 years older than the Chasse-Po. The Dreyse was developed in the early 1840s, and so its manual of arms is substantially more complicated and less efficient than the Chasse-Po. When the Chasse-Po was developed, people had bolt-action rifles. Not a lot of them, granted, but um, the Chasse-Po is just a much more modern handling gun than either the Carcano or Dreyse needle fire rifles, and I think it's a, a clear winner for best needle fire rifle out there. Um, you know, I was I was about to say it was also the most successful. It was definitely more successful than the Carcano. Um, by the way, the Carcano needle fire is the same. Um, uh, same Carcano as the guy who developed the bolt action Carcanos. The needle fire was his first major firearms design project. Anyway, it's I, I would I didn't think to look up total production numbers for all the different models of the Dreyse because there were a lot of different models. But I suspect production of the Chasse-Po was substantially higher than all of the Dreyses put together. So I will go out on a limb and say the Chasse-Po was the best and the most successful and the most produced and most used and best used of the needle fire rifles. Next up, uh, Richard said, if you were Santa Claus and you had a list that you had checked twice, uh, what gun would you give to those who had been naughty and what gun to those who'd been nice? Uh, <laughs> naughty, I would give, I would give everyone on the naughty list a uh, one of those Arsenal double 1911s because those things are awful. Uh, the only problem there is they're awful, but they bring a lot of money because people think they look cool, um, and the price is high, and there aren't a ton of them out there. So the problem is, I guess all of my naughty people would then just sell those things and have a big pile of money. So 
the easy answer, I suppose, is, well, I give them all zip 22s, because those are also terrible, and they're also not worth anything. But I did want to highlight the fact that that Arsenal double 1911 is an incredibly awkward gun that is just... I have a, a good friend who uh, got one of those and did some promotional work on it, and later told me, this is the most awful gun I have ever fired in my life. Anyway, uh, the people who have been nice get what would Stoner do 2020 rifles, or carbines, from Brownells, because in my mind those are super cool, and for me that is my single most practical gun that I own if I had to run out of my house with only one firearm, not knowing what sort of practical thing I might have to do with it, it would be that gun. And I would love to have see them in the hands of more people, so I would give one to everyone who's been nice, if I were Santa Claus. Next up is Pete. Pete says, the Stoner 63 displays some clever engineering, but what was the actual point? Was this supposed to... Uh, what, what was the supposed military benefit of a modular weapon like this? You said that changing between configuration was an armorer's job, not something the infantryman would do in the field. If you had to hand in your carbine to the unit armor so he can give it back the next day as a light machine gun, why not have him just hand out a purpose-built light machine gun instead? There seems to be no operational benefit at all, and in a whole military setting with conversion costs and the fact that your overall mix of configurations probably won't vary all that much, there doesn't even seem to be a cost benefit. I think the original intent, um, it was certainly was not for the infantry to be swapping their guns around into different configurations. The goal was to sell this as a complete package to a country that was looking to do something like replace all of its bolt-action rifles with modern new self-loading rifles, or, you know, replace whatever guns it had with something completely new. Because as a whole military package, there is absolutely a logistical advantage in this level of interchangeability. And I think you see a similar thing with the Soviets and the, uh, the AKM, along with the AKMS and the, uh, uh, the RPK, where no one, you know, soldiers are not going to go exchange their folding stocks for fixed stocks, certainly not their underfolding stocks, and they're not going to switch their infantry rifles into squad automatic, you know, RPK light machine guns. But you get a benefit logistically from those, all three of those guns sharing a large number of parts. And the same thing holds true for the stoners. Um, being able to produce universal parts so that you can replace you can fix a rifle, or a machine gun, or a vehicular mounted machine gun, or a saw, or a marksman's rifle. Anything that breaks, there's a good chance that it's going to be one universal part involved in fixing it. That really does have a benefit. Now, let's say you're Colt in that situation, uh, or Cadillac Gage in that situation, and you're trying to sell, I don't know, El Salvador, a complete new arms package based on the Stoner 63 system. Well. If the US Navy comes to you and says, hey, we kind of like the light machine gun version, we'd like to try that out for the SEALs, you're not going to turn them away and say, oh no, you have to buy the whole package. No, you're going to be very, very happy to sell them any individual components they would like. The problem is, if it turns out that that's your only real sale, and El Salvador and Indonesia and North Elbonia never show up at your doorstep looking to buy the complete package, then when you look back on this historically, you'll say, what was the point? You know, the, the Navy didn't get any logistical advantage whatsoever from deploying a handful of, of Stoner 63 uh, varieties to the SEAL teams. And you're right, they didn't get any logistical advantage. Um, but that doesn't mean that the system didn't make sense from the perspective of those who built it when they built it. Edward says, you have been hired as a technical advisor on the next James Bond film. It is a remake of Dr. No, and contains the classic scene where Bond is forced to give up his unreliable Beretta and start carrying a Walther PPK. However, the new film is set in 2020 and you have been asked for recommendations of newer pistols. So what is the perfect 2020 spy pistol to replace Bond's unsatisfactory Taurus curve? <laughs> uh, I think first off, the 25 caliber Beretta that hit like a brick through a plate glass window um, in the original was far superior to a Taurus curve, and I'm very sorry for any James Bond that has been carrying a Taurus curve. So what would I give him? Um, let me preface this by saying that the newest 
swankiest stuff on the market isn't really my forte, uh, but I am thinking I would give him a SIG P365XL with a red dot on it. And my, my rationale in that is, first off, the idea of a spy pistol I think is a little bit questionable in the first place. Um, I think this is much more of a secret agent, fictional secret agent thing than an actual espionage thing, because are you really, is a real espionage agent going to be able to shoot his way out of, an, like effectively shoot his way out of a predicament with a concealable pistol? And how does, what like, what's the likelihood of that compared to getting caught and having to explain a pistol and having to suffer far greater consequences for doing a thing while carrying a pistol as opposed to doing a thing while carrying, well, anything other than a pistol. So I don't know how realistic this is, but the way that Bond uses a pistol, in theory, what I'm thinking is we want something that is compact, it's easily concealable, but it's going to allow ideal marksmanship. It's going to give him some limited amount of volume of fire, because when we see Bond in gunfights, it's he's usually fighting several guys. I think the 365 XL in particular is, well, from handling them, they're kind of remarkably like a real full-size pistol, just smaller. Which may sound kind of obvious, but a lot of very small automatic pistols feel like compact pistols with all of the disadvantages thereof. They're difficult to shoot well, they have poor triggers, they have small magazines, the ergonomics just don't work. You know, you're kind of trying to hold them with a couple fingers. The 365 just feels like a small version of a real pistol. Um, it's got a very nice trigger. You can stick one of the, the really compact red dots on it, and I think get tremendous effectiveness. Um, in theory, you could go so far as to stick a, a muzzle compensator on, which would actually do some good with a short barreled nine parabellum pistol. And I think that would be pretty darn good. There may well be some other options out there that I'm not thinking of, and I'm deliberately avoiding anything that is a full-size service pistol because I think that's inappropriate for secret agent James Bond, unless he's becoming Rambo the, you know, the special forces invader. Otherwise, you know, oh, well, shoot, we'll give him something really cool, like one of the new aliens. But no, I'll go with a 365XL with a compact red dot on it. All right, next up is Joshua, who says, what are the best and worst folding stocks for rifles or submachine guns? One, so the best folding stocks are going to be the ones that have equal ergonomics to fixed stocks, that sacrifice nothing in terms of uh, shoulder placement, cheek placement, getting a good sight picture, and also have hinge mechanisms that have absolutely no wobble to them. And one of the best examples I can think of of that is the Daewoo K2, which has an excellent stock. It's basically the exact same profile as a standard fixed stock, and it's got a monstrously beefy uh, hinge mechanism, um, pretty similar to what's on the FAL. I don't think I've ever seen one that was actually loose or rattly. There are other guns that are similar. Um, a lot of the modern um, AK-74 folding stocks are really quite excellent for the same reason. They use kind of the same, the same style, same pattern of stock as the fixed variety, and they have a pretty darn solid folding mechanism. Uh, the worst, the absolute worst I think I can ever recall seeing is on the Rising M55, which is a single bent piece of wire it's not centered on the gun, it's slapped onto the left side of the gun, and the only thing that locks it in tension is a piece of spring steel in a sort of U or C shape that the stock snaps into. As long as it's brand new, it's actually reasonably stable, like it doesn't wobble, but the cheek weld is atrocious. And if it gets worn, if that C clamp thing gets bent at all, it's not a matter of the stock might start to wobble, it's the stock might actually like collapse on you while you're shooting. Uh, a runner-up would probably, and this isn't rifle or submachine gun, but a runner-up would be the collapsing stock on Cobra's Terminator shotgun, which is also atrocious. Uh, it has a terrible cheek weld, and it has a propensity for coming loose and collapsing on recoil, which then slams the back of the gun into the user's face. So that might actually be worse than the Rising, because the Rising's will 9mm subgun that's probably not actually going to hurt you if the stock collapses. The 
Cobra Terminator was terrible in every way, and the stock was a big part of it. Alrighty, next we have Tony, who says, what was the status of NFA items, which is to say uh, machine guns, short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, etc., during the 1994 assault weapons ban? And I initially looked at this and went, well, you know, whatever, not an interesting question. And then I thought about it and went, you know what, actually, there's a lot of people around now who weren't around during, or weren't collecting guns during the assault weapons ban, and that's actually a rather interesting question. So. Um, NFA items were not affected really at all by the assault weapons ban. So one of the big factors of the 1994 bill was that it grandfathered anything that was currently in existence, both firearms and magazines, and that absolutely applied to NFA items. So if you had a machine gun, uh, it was grandfathered in, and it didn't really matter that it was a machine gun versus semi-auto, because if you had a semi-auto version of the exact same gun, uh, on the day that the ban went into effect, well, it was grandfathered in too. Um, one effect you would see on, on across the board was magazines. Existing magazines were also grandfathered, but you couldn't manufacture new magazines for civilian sale. And of course you have a lot of machine guns, virtually all machine guns are going to use the same magazines as their semi-auto counterparts. So if you had a full auto G3 or a full auto M16 or anything like that, you are going to be under the same limitations trying to find new magazines as owners of its semi-auto counterparts. Now the obvious subtext here is how would this apply to any future similar legal action? And the answer to that is there's no way to know, uh, because any hypothetical future legal situation is by its definition hypothetical and in the future, and until you have an actual piece of legislation that you can look at and read the details of, there is absolutely no way to know if it will grandfather things in, not grandfather things in, confiscate things, not con like until you actually have a specific uh, proposed piece of legislation to look at. You, I don't know. Uh, next question is from Charles. It says, the recently introduced FK Bruneau 7.5 is supposedly the new hot handgun round. From the published data it appears to be almost 762 by 39 uh, in handgun form. Mm, I don't know that I'd go quite that far. Also the diameter of the bullet, it's stated to be 7.5, isn't this just a souped up 30 bottlenecked handgun round like 7.62 Tokarev? Uh, conceptually, yes, it's, it's a bottlenecked handgun round, the idea being uh, you can get a, a properly, uh, you know, a bullet of the proper overall configuration that weighs less in a bottlenecked case. You're basically, you want a smaller bullet with a larger case volume. And so the easy way to do that in a handgun is to have a bottlenecked case, because making the cartridge longer puts uh, a lot of engineering challenges into the gun, because now the grip has to be longer. Uh, magazines have to be longer, a lot of people are going to find that uncomfortable and, and undesirable. Now as for 7.5 Bruneau being 762 by 39 rifle cartridge in, in handgun form, uh, not quite so much. Um, we're talking about 7.5 Bruneau is like a, a 95 grain bullet at 2,000 feet per second, which is pretty darn substantial. Uh, however, 7.62 by 39 is 122 or 23 grains at 2400 feet per second, and that 20% increased velocity is not ins insignificant, um, nor is the what 25% increased mass of the bullet. I think the better comparison would be to say 7.5 Bruneau is pretty darn similar to 30 carbine. So you're getting 30 carbine out of a pistol. 30 carbine was 110 grains at 2000 feet per second, so still a heavier bullet. Um, but I think that puts the 7.5 Bruneau in better light. Um, it's also not that far different than the 22 Spitfire, which was 30 carbine, neck down to 22, done by Melvin Johnson back in the 50s, I think, maybe 60s. Um, honestly, I'm. I, you can see the first time that I shot one of the FK Bruneaus on in range. <coughs> uh, we did. Uh, we were at Shot Show and got to test fire one, and I, I, I don't really understand the practical rationale behind the cartridge. I think it, I don't really understand the, the interest in hunting with an auto pistol. 
I don't think the flat trajectory gives that gives you much of particular value because sure a flat trajectory is great it means you don't have to adjust for elevation out to two or maybe 300 yards but there are very few people and I'm certainly not one of them who can effectively shoot a pistol at two or 300 yards like I'm not worried about the drop of nine parabellum at 200 because I can't really hold it accurately enough to hit anything at 200 anyway like once I learned that skill Calculating the holdover, that's not a big deal. Um, and when I say I'm not sure, like I'm not sure I understand the, the interest in a, a large caliber hunting auto pistol, it's because to me a revolver simply makes a lot more sense for that. If I wanted the ballistics for hunting that I get from 7.5 FK, I would look at something like a 357 Maximum, which provides basically the exact same ballistics. Um, allows me to also use a much heavier bullet should I want to. It's going to allow me a nice wide variety of bullet types, and I don't have to worry about trying to make a pistol that can reliably cycle a very high pressure cartridge. Revolvers are simpler in this way, in that each shot, like your first shot, doesn't dictate whether your second shot can happen or not in the way that a malfunctioning auto pistol could. So. Uh, I know high velocity pistol cartridges have always attracted a fair number of people, and I think the FK Bruneau is going to be no different, but I'm not really in that group. I don't quite understand it. Next up we have Hagen, who says, why was the Liberator pistol made in 45 and not 32, which I assume would have also been in production in the US at the time and was more common in Europe? Uh, it would have been. Uh, 32. Uh, ACP or 765 Browning was definitely in production in Europe as well as the US. I think the rationale behind 45 was to make the gun more effective. The whole point of the Liberator was you would never need to resupply it, so it didn't matter what was available in Europe. Liberators were dropped with 10 cartridges, and if you used all 10, like it would be some sort of weird miraculous situation by which you were able to fire 10 rounds through a Liberator and not get yourself a better gun, and also not get yourself killed. So if you're going to have a gun like that that's basically a one-shot chance at shooting a Nazi, um, best do it in a big caliber. Like it'd really suck if you got a decent shot off with a Liberator and, and it wasn't effective. It wasn't a one-shot stop. Like, you know, use the big cartridge, give people the best chance at being successful with it, which rarely happened. Um, the gun was not one of the objectively better decisions of how to spend resources, I think, but it's a, it's a very romantic idea. Bones said, did John Garand make any guns other than the M1 Garand, and if so, were they successful? Yes, he, um, he developed a variety of different guns, none of them were Frankly, none of them were successful at all. Certainly none of them uh, to the level of the M1 that we're all familiar with. John Garand was an employee of Springfield Armory, and so a lot of what he did was developmental work on behalf of the Armory. Uh, he designed a prototype for the M1 carbine trials that was submitted by Springfield. Um, he did some designs after World War II, or in you know towards the later end of World War II. He was involved in some of the um, the modifications, like the, the E patterns of M1 Garand, of let's experiment with what can we do with this Garand? Let's give it a short folding stock, let's give it a box magazine, let's change up the gas system to some other things. He was involved in some of that stuff. You can see some of, there's a great picture of him with a bullpup rifle taken after World War II, um, but nothing he did was ever nearly as successful, uh, was never successful on any scale like the M1 was. And I'll point out, he spent well over a decade. Effectively that was about a 20 year process to get the M1 Garand into, ever, into the hands of American soldiers as a standard issue weapon. That was a very long process. And so if you think about someone's career, and you're going to take 20 years of it and devote it to one specific project, how many more projects is he going to have the opportunity to be successful at? Well, unless he's John Browning, not a whole lot. So. Um, and I don't mean that to take anything away from Garand. He was, uh, he was brilliant, he was very successful, um, 
but yeah, it, the, the M1 was pretty much a one-hit wonder. Thunderchild says militaries and companies seem to keep trying to shoot around corners and never manage to make it work. Curved barrels, the corner shotgun, mirrored optics, is there any solution that isn't super impractical? This is an easy one, no. <laughs> Every solution I've ever seen for shooting around corners is in fact super impractical. The one thing that might make it reasonably feasible is if you have an eyepiece with a heads-up display that shows you the sight picture of your firearm. And you can stick the gun out and just hold it around a corner, and the sight is transmitted into your eyepiece. That would be the most practical possible way to do a corner shot sort of thing. Every single time you're going to develop a gun to mechanically accommodate a corner, you're going to end up with something that's decent, probably, for shooting around a corner, but terribly inefficient for normal shooting, and normal shooting accounts for the vast majority of actual use of those guns. The best thing I could see would be like, you get a deliver, you know, a uniquely corner shooting gun, and you give it to one person in some sort of law enforcement or security team whose job is only to shoot around a corner. And it's not a combat weapon, it's, it's for a very limited situation where you know, the guys are going to deploy out of a van and they're going to be shooting in that building right there, and once the event's over then they all go back home. This, this is not something you deploy to a combat zone. Uh, Caleb says, congratulations, you just won the lottery for all the monies. What's the coolest firearms related, but not an actual firearm, thing that you buy? Um, and he gave a whole bunch of examples, and the one that I would absolutely choose is a shooting range. I would love to have a private shooting range, and the swankier and bigger the better. Um, now the trick is, of course, to have a really cool, really big shooting range you also have to live pretty much way out in the sticks where it's not going to be a tremendous nuisance to the people around you, and of course where you just have a large enough piece of property to have, say an 800 meter range or a thousand yard range. Um, and there are downsides to living that far away from everyone and everything else. That's a separate debate. I would love to have a range that had remote control targets, pop-up targets, moving targets, self-resetting targets, uh, you know, a nice setup with an automated radar chronograph so that you don't have to set up gear to measure muzzle velocities. Uh, oh man, I could spend more than all the monies building myself the ultimate awesome private range and then never have to worry about anyone else shooting on it, shoot anything I want, like machine guns, which for example, uh, none of the ranges that I use where we shoot two gun matches allow full auto, which kind of hampers my desire to shoot light machine guns in a two gun match. A lot of light machine guns don't actually have a semi-auto setting, and uh, if you get thrown out of the range for having a single double or three round burst, that's incentive not to use those guns in a match. Anyway, I digress. I would build myself the awesomest range if I won the lottery and had all the monies. Uh, Craig says, with the size of your YouTube fan base, have you found yourself commenting on things or presenting videos differently than you did before things really took off and you became a Confluencer. Yes, I absolutely do. I find that I comment on things a lot less now than I would have many years ago. The problem is the impact that a comment can make can be well beyond what it ought to. Um, a single, you know, an offhanded comment or an offhanded criticism about something can come back to have a really significant unintended undesired impact on something like, say, a small-scale developer, a small producer, um, someone who's, you know, on that kind of knife edge of will this commercial endeavor work or will it fail? And it's, it's tough to be able to, you know, you may see something where it's like, here's a minor criticism, but if I say it, a substantial number of people will probably latch onto it and discount the product or the concept as a result. Um, so it puts you in a situation of how do you... What I find, frankly, is that I, I prefer to do developmental stuff, like product testing sort of stuff, behind the scenes. I like to do it in private, 
so that I can talk about concerns and give a product the best chance to be improved to the point of really being viable before it gets PR. Because I'd hate for, I hate it if something comes out and it's like 95% great, but it's got this one glaring problem that makes it unreliable. If you release that in public, you're likely to have, you know, it's hard to recover from a bad first impression, let me put it that way. And so I tried, I would much rather have people avoid a bad first impression and be able to wait to talk about something until I know it's the best that it can be. Um, and there are other places where you know, a minor complaint on my part gets interpreted as something much more significant by a large number of people, and that has massively unfortunate repercussions that I didn't intend and that the, the person or thing I'm complaining about doesn't deserve. So yeah, I, I tend to comment on things a lot less. I find myself thinking about a comment and then going, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not going to say that today. Or you know, you type out something and then sit on it for an hour and then go, yeah, we're going to delete that before we post it. Alright, we have two questions left. The first one is from Firefly, who says, It's the 1930s and you've been appointed Chief Small Arms Procurement Officer of an unspecified neutral nation. You're tasked with choosing the next light machine gun for the military. Lengthy trials have produced two clear favorites, the FND and the ZB Model 30. Which do you pick and why? I think that is a fantastic question. Um, and that, those, I think, are very likely the two candidates you would end up with in a situation like this. And to me it kind of depends on, well, it's, a, it's a great choice because there is no clear winner to my mind, it depends on what exactly is the role of this firearm in the military. So the FND is basically the final evolution of the BAR. It has a bottom mounted magazine, which means you're limited in magazine capacity really to about 20 rounds. Uh, in theory you could stick a 30 or 40 round mag on it, but then the gun kind of just monopods up on the magazine and it's too tall. Um, however, it's got a, a good pistol grip to it and it's got a, a reasonably good front grip. Um, and it is much better suited to shooting off the shoulder or using as an automatic rifle style of firearm. Um, more amenable to a one man to one man operation instead of a crew. Definitely better with a crew, but it's a light machine gun that blurs into automatic rifle a little bit. Where the ZB30 is, this is by the way the ancestor of the Bren gun, um, it is a nice improved version of the ZB26, which is good. Um, the Yugoslav, the ZB30J, is going to add adjustable gas regulation, um, which is a nice improvement, which the FND does also have. However, it's got a top mounted magazine and it doesn't really have much in the way of a front handguard. It's a gun that is much better as a light machine gun, and, and it kind of skews the other way where it's more suited to dropping it on a tripod and having it blend a little bit into general purpose machine gun category. With a top mounted magazine makes it a little bit better suited for a two man team, uh, one man loading, one man shooting. The magazine is just more easily accessible for a dedicated loader uh, to work with. So they're both outstanding guns. I don't think the country would be uh, in bad shape with either one, but the choice really comes down to do we want something that's going to qual going to blend into automatic rifle, or do we want something that's going to blend a little bit more into static machine gun? I will give a specific answer though based on my own personal quirks, and that is if offered the two, I would probably go with the FND simply because I am left-handed. The FND has sights that are right on top of the receiver center line and very easy to use either left or right-handed, where the ZB with its top mounted magazine has its sights offset on the left side of the gun, which are a bit awkward to use as a left-hander. So um, I would not necessarily let that influence a military decision though. And our last question is from Barton who says, now uh, that the what would stoner do specifications are finished, what are your best arguments for someone buying a rifle in this configuration as compared to the plethora of AR variants already on the market? Excellent question. And I think my answer would be that every component in the WWSD 2020 rifles, 
which by the way, a collaborative project with Carl Casarda of InRange. We started working on this back in 2017. There's a ton of video about it over on InRange that you can check out, um, and it was very cool that Brownells was interested and stepped up to be our exclusive retailer of a complete WWSD 2020 rifle. But um, every component in that rifle was very specifically chosen for one or more reasons. And the reasons are not because it's what we had available. Um, for example, the carbon fiber float tube was chosen because it is lightweight, it does not absorb heat, and it's durable. Um, we specifically chose a pencil weight barrel to reduce weight, to give it the proper balance, and we chose one from Faxon that was properly nitrided because it allows the barrel to heat up without shifting point of zero, which is a. We think that the pencil barrel was a really good idea in the original early AR 15s and M16s, and the specific barrel that we have in our rifle allows us to get the same benefit while avoiding the downsides that were present with those early barrels in the 60s, which is poor, by modern standards, poor heat treat that caused them to shift point of zero upon heating. Um, the chrome bolt carrier is chosen specifically because we think chrome, chrome plating, is the best surface finish to use on the bolt carrier for cleaning with the AR sort of direct impingement style of operating system. And again, it's a system, it's a, a, a type of part that was tried back in the 60s and didn't work out for technical reasons that have been corrected today. Um, the ambidextrous controls are there for a specific reason, to allow shooting with left-handers and shooting on the opposite shoulder. The monolithic polymer receiver allows us to reduce cost in that area, to increase durability, and to make the gun simpler. Um, we looked at every single component of the gun and thought about, do we want this, do we not want it? If we want it, what does it need to do, and what's the best way that we can address that, with the end goal being a rifle that is accurate, reliable, light, and handy. Uh, basically the same mission requirements of the original M16. So yes, I realize what would Stoner do after the M16? Well he went to Knight's Armament and he designed a bunch of stuff and you can take a look at it and see exactly what Stoner did. Our question here was, if you were going to redesign to build the M16 as it originally was produced uh, with that uh, design philosophy and purpose, but you were doing it with today's materials, what would be the best way to do it? And I think the plethora of other AR-15's uh, configurations that are available today are largely based on uh, what parts are available, what parts are cheapest, what parts look cool to people who maybe haven't put any real thought into why they have them. Um, for example, justify the use of an M4 profile barrel. Why do you have the extra weight in that barrel? Are you concerned about uh, the barrel bending when you do bayonet practice in the Marine Corps? Are you concerned about actually clamping a grenade launcher onto the bottom of it? I think those are relatively unlikely scenarios for most people out there buying an AR-15. So uh, yeah, you ask me to justify the, the what would Stoner do, and that's it, is we have consciously given thought to every part and why every single individual part is there. So if you're interested in them, by all means check them out on Brownells. It is a relatively expensive rifle, although frankly less so now that we're in like giant gun scarcity mode 2020, um, less so than it was a year ago. But I think it's a fantastically cool rifle. I'm very excited about the fact that they are now out. Um, being able to turn our thought experiment of 2017 into an actual commercial product that is in fact better in a vast number of ways from our original 2017 rifles is really exciting and really cool. Anyway, that is all the questions that I have for today. So. Uh, a big thanks to everyone on Patreon for continuing to make Forgotten Weapons possible, and if you want to add uh, whiskey bullets to your uh, freezer and or your, uh, your liquor cabinet, check out the link for the Forgotten Weapons merch shop in the description text below where you can get a set of them yourself. Thanks for watching!